it seems to me that the, the rapture theory as normally conceived tries to base itself on a couple of verses towards the end of First Thessalonians 4, but reads them out of context and puts them into a framework of thought which is strictly speaking a dualistic framework in which the name of the game is to leave earth behind and go to heaven instead. Whereas the whole point of the last scene in the book of Revelation, Revelation 21, is not that people are going up from earth to heaven, as in the so-called rapture, but that the new Jerusalem is coming down from heaven to earth. The rapture theology gets its mileage particularly, as I was saying last night in a lecture, from that implicit Gnosticism which regards the world as a shabby or bad or dangerous place and sees the point of religion as being to escape the world. But the whole point of Jesus' teaching and proclamation, the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer, is that God's kingdom shall come and his will be done on earth as in heaven. And at the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He doesn't say, I'm off to heaven and the sooner you can come and join me, the better. That's not how it works. <laughs> and, in, and in 1 Thessalonians 4, Jesus will appear, and Paul is, Paul is doing three things in 1 Thessalonians 4, echoing, on the one hand, Moses coming down the mountain, the blast of the trumpet and so on. Um, on the other hand, Caesar coming to a town or city, part of his empire, and the citizens going out to meet him somewhere outside the town because they wouldn't just stay in town waiting for him. That would be very impolite and perhaps politically dangerous. And thirdly, he's echoing Daniel chapter 7. Now, Paul does this. Paul mixes his metaphors. He takes different images and he shoves them together. In the next chapter, in 1 Thessalonians 5, he warns people uh, that the thief is coming in the night, so the woman is going to go into labor, so you mustn't um, get drunk, but must stay awake and put on your armor. Now... <laughs> So when he says that there is coming a time when it'll, it'll be a bit like Moses coming down the mountain and the people looking up to see him. It'll be a bit like Daniel 7, the son of man coming up on the clouds. And it'll be a bit like Caesar arriving at a city. We shouldn't expect to get a woodenly literal historical picture out of that. And the point about the parousia, about the royal appearance of Caesar with, uh, at a town, is that the citizens go out to meet him. We go to meet the Lord in the air. Whatever Paul thought would be the objective correlate of that. Not in order to stay there, but in order to escort Caesar, or whoever it is, back into the town. So even if you want to take Thessalon 1 Thessalonians 4 moderately literally, then you would have to say that the reason for meeting the Lord is not to stay away up in heaven, but in order to escort him to the place which is his by right, which is this earth. And with that, I have basically deconstructed, I think, the worldview within which the rapture uh, gets its, gets its uh, emphasis. And it seems to me that a fully biblical eschatology has to talk not about that but about the new heavens and the new earth the new creation which is our birthright as christians and over the whole of which jesus is lord this eschatology is to be articulated in the face of caesar and his imperial hope and when paul uses the word parousia second coming or appearing Parousia is not an Old Testament technical term, it is a Caesar technical term. It's what happens when Caesar has been away from Rome on a journey or fighting a battle, and he comes back, his royal appearing, his royal and perhaps divine appearing, because by this time some of the Caesars at least started to give themselves divine honours. And everyone goes out to meet him, to welcome him back into the city. That's the parousia. That's what's going on in 1 Thessalonians 4. Jesus is coming back, and it is at his name that every knee will bow. Philippians 3, where Paul has been saying, I want you to imitate me, and well, he's just been talking about how he gives up his privileges as a, as a Jew, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and all the rest of it. How can the Philippians give up their privileges? Well, they're not Jews, most of them, but they are, some of them at least, citizens of the Roman Empire, and they all benefit from Rome. He says, I want you to sit light to that. I want you to sit loose to it.
because their God is the belly. They glory in their shame with their mind set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And let me tell you, we didn't discuss this this afternoon, though we might have done. When Paul says our citizenship is in heaven, he does not mean, therefore, one day we'll be going there. Because the, how, the, how the whole logic of citizenship works. Rome had founded colonies around the Greek world, some way to the east of them, because they'd fought all kinds of civil wars a century before the time of Paul, and there were all these old soldiers out there, and the last thing Rome wanted was those old soldiers coming back to Italy, or let alone to Rome. Old soldiers coming back with too much uh, uh, loot and booty on their hands but nowhere to live are a real pain for a small city that's already overcrowded like Rome. So you found colonies who are citizens of Rome, but colonizing Greece, or wherever they are, with Roman culture. When Paul says our citizenship is in heaven, he doesn't mean, so when we retire, we'll go back there. He means you are the people who are bringing the civilization of heaven into the world in which you are placed. And it is from heaven that we expect the savior, the Lord, the King, Jesus. Those are all Caesar words who will change the body of our humiliation to be like the body of his glory by the power which enables him to subject all things to himself. Paul has often quotes Psalm 8. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you take thought for him? You have made him little lower than the angels and crown him with glory and honor, putting all things in subjection under his feet. Paul would have said that is the Adam picture and it is also the Jesus picture. And it is the picture because of which we know that Jesus is Lord and Caesar isn't. I referenced it in kind of when we were talking about creation in a previous episode, that many people don't understand or have strong convictions regarding the beginning of scripture, and nor do they have strong convictions or understanding regarding the end of scripture. So my question for you is, what is the book of Revelation about? What is the tribulation? And when in the tribulation is there a rapture and a returning Jesus Christ. Can you help provide some wisdom for us? <laughs> oh, a big question. Yeah, yeah. Well, just let's just say this at the beginning. God is very precise. Okay, mm -hmm. God is very precise. He didn't come to the end of the Bible and lose his train of thought. Okay, yeah. and then say, hey, you can make up anything you want. So I, I flew 35 hours one night, day and night, ended up in Kazakhstan, right? I'm in Kazakhstan. It's the first pastors conference there's 1600 pastors jammed into this building first one in history after the breakup of the soviet union and they want me to teach the doctrine of the church in six days so about the third day the guys call me in and they say when are you get into the good part and i said what do you mean the good part you know i'm working hard to get this stuff across <laughs> and they say well the part about the future when are you get into that and i said you know like when the lord comes when are you going to get to that because they had very little food. They had big pots out behind the church and it was raining. So they always had soup because the rain just filled up the soup thing and they'd throw potatoes in. And, I mean, they didn't have much. So they were, they were looking for, for Christ to come back. So I said, okay, on Friday, I'm gonna do that. So on Friday, I said, here's how it goes. It's gonna be the rapture of the church. That's an unsigned event. In other words, there's no sign preliminary to that event. It's going to be suddenly in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, snatching out the church. Then there's gonna be a period of seven years of tribulation. Um, Daniel refers to that period and that period is laid out in the book of Revelation repeatedly, even the numbers are laid out. Um, the events are laid out from Revelation 6 through 19. I went all through that and I said, that's gonna be followed by the return of Jesus Christ to establish his thousand year kingdom. And it, I think it uses the word thousand in Revelation 20 about six times, so it's not obscure. And at the end of the thousand years, Satan has a rebellion. Satan's rebellion is, is basically ended. And then the entire universe as we know it uh, literally implodes in an atomic implosion and the Lord creates a new heaven and the new earth. And I, I unpacked that one whole day. Mm. And at the end of the day, the leaders came to me. That no schools, no training. There are no Bible schools in the former Soviet Union. They have no training. And the leaders came to me and said, we believe what you believe. And I said, really? You would have to go to school to get that wrong. Mm. It's crystal clear. You have the church on earth in Revelation 1 to 3. All of a sudden, the church is in heaven in Revelation 4 and 5, which indicates the rapture. 
Tribulation breaks out in Revelation 6, runs to 19. In 19, Christ comes, establishes his kingdom. The kingdom runs for a thousand years, then the new heaven and the new earth at the end of the book of Revelation. That is the simplest, that is the simplest book in the New Testament if you're looking for a chronological outline. Hmm. So you, you gotta, somebody's gotta tell you it's not true, just like Genesis. Yeah. You have to say, oh, no, 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 the evolution happened in Genesis. And, oh, no, no, it can't be that simple. It can't be chronological like the book of Revelation. And yet the book of Revelation starts by saying this, blessed is the one who reads and understands this book. Yeah. I'm not that smart. I just took the book and here are these guys who never had any formal training. All they had was a Bible and they could see that. They understood that. it. Well, th what you said I love about the earnestness of those pastors in Kazakhstan, they're telling us, tell us about the future, or they're right. telling you that. What well, would be... The present was pretty harsh. Sure, yeah. yeah. No, and, and so what would be your, kind of the importance that you would place on even us as believers anticipating a returning Jesus Christ? I think it's often neglected. We don't pray often, and you don't, I don't hear it often, Jesus, come quickly. What is the importance of anticipating the return of Jesus Christ for the life of a believer? Well, I mean, we're told to set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Uh, we, we get too, too earthbound. Uh, and, you know, I, I would say that's not always the same in every culture mm -hmm. or in every period of history. Uh, it's tougher for us because we have so much. Uh, if, if you're living in a mud hut in Africa and you become Christian, Christian you, you're gonna long for the coming of Christ in ways that we don't because we have too many distractions. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this, living in this culture, we have to hack our way through to even think about heaven. Uh, heaven seems, um, how can I say it? Not even as good an option as Disneyland mm -hmm. because we're so into running from one thrill and one high to another that we don't experience the pains of life. They're basically leveled out in a highly technical culture like ours is and with all the medical stuff that we've got. And we don't face death. I mean, death is even hidden from us when it happens. So I think it's easy to forget about heaven uh, and become earthbound. For me, the attraction of heaven, I, I'm, I'm happy for the Pearl Gates and I'm happy for the Gold Streets, but the attraction of heaven is literally a weariness with the flesh. And if you're like 15 or 18 years old, you, you're, you're not weary with the flesh yet. I mean, maybe you haven't even gotten married and you're, you're looking for the Can right girl. Can you define girl. what you mean by that? Tired of the battle with sin, tired not only in, in the struggle in your own life with it, but yeah. tired of the struggle around you with it. I'm like, I'm in my 80s and I, I, my ministry hadn't slowed down at all. I'm constantly fighting on all kinds of fronts. You know, it's like Paul said, um, uh, when he referred to Ephesus, he said, there's a wide open door and many adversaries. Paul said at the end of his life, I fought the good fight. I mean, it's a fight. Mm. It's a fight. It's a fight against sin in, in our own lives and weakness and, and failure and then in all the people around us and we're trying to move the kingdom forward one life at a time. And I've, I've even said to some people, you know, you're gonna have to reintroduce yourself to me when I get to heaven because I'm not gonna recognize you when you're perfect. Um, but I, but I, I think there's a kind of time when you just say, okay, Lord, um, um, anytime is fine with me. And then when the battle's over and you just want to be faithful to the end. I'm thankful it's a reality. You know, Peter says we have an imperishable, undefiled inheritance stored up for us who are in Christ. And, and we need to- Reserved for you. Reserved for us. Yeah, and that's something that believers need to contemplate and consider and anticipate and as you said it's not obscure it's clear and it's right there for us in the scripture so thank you pastor john